We thank you that it will fall on good soil, Father God. <coughs> As we minister your word, we pray that people will receive revelation knowledge. And Father, we give you honor and we give you glory for it in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. I just want to back up a little bit of what I talked about last week just for a minute because we're going along the same lines today. But it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and verse 9, For you, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, least any man should boast. And last week we talked about the balance of grace and faith. And I, I asked, people ask me this question all the time. What do I need to do to receive the blessings of God? And people say that all the time. I don't know why I'm not receiving the blessings of God. And they explain it this way. I've been praying. I've been reading my Bible. I've been going to church. I've been doing everything I should do. But I don't seem to be having my prayers answered. And I turned around and said, well, the question is, it lies in the root of the problem. And the problem is we fall into a trap where we want to, uh, linking God's response to our performance Okay? Now, listen, it's important to pray. It's important to give your offerings. It's important to do all those things. But that doesn't necessarily mean that your prayers are going to get answered. It lies in the fact that we are people of faith. And we have to believe that God is going to move by faith. Okay? Those things are important. So I'm not minimizing those because there is a balance between grace and faith, all right? And their relationship to one another. And that's what we really talked about last week. You need to pray. You need to read your Bible. You need to go to church. You need to be involved in church activities, such as the men's fellowship, all right? But you don't do it as a performance to God. And I try to get this across to people. I don't need to do it to get God's approval. I, once I received Jesus as my Savior, I was approved. Okay, I do it because I love God. I do it because I appreciate what he's done for me in his death, burial, and resurrection. That's why I do it. Not because I'm forced to do it, not because I'm obligated to do it. I do it because I love God and what he's done for me. Amen. And the love of God is what constrains me to do the things that I do. I am not forced to do anything. I am not forced to be here on Sunday mornings. I do this because I love God and he's given me a mission. Can you say amen? amen. And, and we saw, by definition, the word grace simply means unmerited favor, unearned, undeserved. Therefore, there's good news. And the good news is, grace has nothing to do with you. But it has everything to do with God. Because we are under His grace. Grace has nothing to do with you. And grace existed before you ever existed. Before you were ever here, grace was already... In operation, and last week we said grace is God's part, and and faith is defined as a positive response to God's grace, a positive response to what God has already provided through us, to us through grace. That's the important part. So faith is the positive response to God's grace, or and, or and faith, and what faith does is appropriate what God has already provided. Appropriate means to grab, to take hold of, to seize. He, he provided prosperity. He provided healing. He provided all these things. It's up to us to buy faith and go out and do it. He's not going to give you any, he's not going to provide any more grace or any more prosperity than he already has provided for you. You need to grab hold of it. All right? Humility is just a large part of this. We'll see this in a little while. So, the grace and faith work together. All right? A lot of people were, maybe, I think, were under the assumption last week that I said, well, you can just go out and live like you want to because you're under grace. No, that's not the way that works. Okay? That's why we have 1 John 1 9. Because we do mess up. All right? We do have personal sins that happens in our life. So, and we have 1 John 1 9 to go to, because if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin. But the big sin of not receiving Jesus as your Savior is the one that you have the grace to get. Amen? Amen. We're clear on that now. All right, good. Praise God. Uh, well, I'm, anyway. And, 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 like, and also, I, I, we looked at this last week, just to, by way of remembrance. 
We read a passage of scripture just like the one we read, for by grace are you saved. And it's not one or the other. Grace already saved the entire world. Faith latches onto it. So if a person doesn't have faith in Jesus, God's grace does absolutely nothing for them. He's given you the grace. The grace is the sin has been paid. The price has been paid for the sin. That's grace. Now, all you have to do, and that's what we're going to look at this morning. We're going to look at grace, the power of the gospel. Because personally, I think we have it backwards. Well, the way we try to reach people, the way we try to get people saved, we just want to beat the snot out of them. Okay. Praise God. Salvation is dependent on the grace of God. Because if it's not, I'm sorry, it's not, back up, it's not dependent on just grace. You need the faith. Because if it was dependent on grace, everybody would be saved and go to heaven and we might as well not be here no more. Right. All right? They have to, there's an action that we have to do. So, today, turn to Romans chapter 1, verse 16. It says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. <laughs> For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And the gospel is the most basic foundational message of the New Testament. It's the whole reason Jesus came. And yet, I believe a lot of times it's misunderstood. It's so simple. Today's religious system is not preaching the same gospel that Paul preached. Because they mix it with the law. Okay? And that isn't the gospel of Paul. They mix it with performance. The only thing you need to do to perform is to get on your knees and ask Jesus to come and live in your heart. That's the only performance part of this thing you have to get saved. Get on your knees, receive Jesus. That's it. After that, there's no more performance. It's believing God. And if you do sin, you have 1 John 1, 9, because that original sin, the sin that separated you from God, the sin that Adam and Eve committed in the garden, is washed away the moment you receive Jesus as your Savior. Now you have to work out your salvation. You have to walk in it every day. But you don't have to keep a set of rules and regulations. And that's where the church at large is messed up. Amen. Amen. See, the reason the book of uh, uh, Romans was written was to explain the gospel so that anybody could understand it. And he made it simple. Paul made it simple. And I really believe you have to have somebody to help you misunderstand it. Because it's simple. The God, we used to have a saying when we were first got saved. It was called, kiss. Keep it simple, stupid. And we, and we mess it up. We make it difficult. All right? And, and, and people's had a lot of help making it hard. And it's not hard. Paul said in Romans, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and then the Gentiles. And that, that, that statement that Paul made, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, that was a radical statement. Because the word gospel in the original Greek was a word that was never really used a lot. And the reason why is because it meant nearly too good to be true news. So there wasn't too many things out, that, out there for them to have that were nearly too good to be true. So we have the word gospel, and it referred to news that was so awesome, nothing really in, out there justified using that word. Nothing was really good, too good. We know it's too good to be true. It's usually not. But this is different. This is too good to be true, and it's true. It's true. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. But why? Why wasn't Paul ashamed of the gospel? Because the gospel is the power of God. 
And it's talking about grace. You know, in Acts chapter 20, verse 24, you don't have to turn there, just write it down. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 16, both use the terms grace and gospel interchangeably. Because grace and gospel are interchangeable words. The gospel is free. We hear people say that all the time. It's free. Grace is free. So you can interchange them. It's saying that when you, when you understand the gospel or the grace of God, it'll release the power of God into your life. Amen. That's huge. Amen. See, all you have to do is believe. Then he goes on and he says, For therein, therein, the next verse in Romans, I'm sorry, is verse 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Everybody say, from faith to faith. Amen. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. That's like five times that, word, that phrase, the just shall live by faith. You think that's pretty important. It's in the Old Testament, it's in the New Testament. The just shall live by faith. Hallelujah. I like that. And, and notice what it doesn't say. That righteousness is not revealed from law to law. Righteousness is revealed from faith to faith. It's not revealed from good deed to good deed. It's not revealed, but it's revealed from faith to faith. So that takes performance out of it. I do good deeds. But why? Because I'm under grace. And I love God. And the love of God constrains me, has me do good things. Not because it doesn't put a chain around my neck to make me do it. Paul said, I'm a happy man. He said in the Acts, I think myself happy. Some of you, the way you're looking, you need to think yourself happy. You look like, give, pass out sugar. Because everybody's been looking like they've been sucking on a lemon. Make some lemonade. Praise the Lord. My wife's the only person I know that can suck on a lemon and smile. We went to breakfast yesterday and she took the lemon and went... Amen. She eats the rind too. <laughs> so, listen, I'm going to give you this statement. Good piece of information for you to consider. Sin won't stop the power of God for salvation from working in your life, but trusting in your own good works will. Now, that's not, I'm not talking about after you get saved. I'm talking about a person who's not saved because they're sinners and that's what sinners do. They sin. So sin is not going to stop the power of God for salvation in their life. If anything, it's going to push them more towards God. Especially when they try to do it in their own strength and just fail miserably every time at it. And, and that's what the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith means. You received it righteousness by grace, through faith. End of story. That's why it's nearly too good to be true news. Am I right? Yes. All right. And when you talk like this, people with a religious mindset immediately say, well, what about sin? It sounds like grace is just giving people a license to sin. I don't think so. Because the last time I checked, they're doing a pretty good job of sinning without a license. Amen. Now, I'm not advocating sin by any stretch of the imagination, but that's the immediate reaction when people start talking about the righteousness of, by faith. You know? They think that you need to make people aware of their sin and the wrath of God. But that's not what Paul ever said. We don't, you know who we need to make aware of their sin and the wrath of God? Believers. Amen. Just kidding. <laughs> but see, but the wrath of God, here's why. The wrath of God is already revealed. 
from heaven against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness. It's already revealed. All right? Uh, who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God had showed it to them. So think about it. It's Romans chapter 18 and 19. Romans chapter 1, 18 and 19. The, the, God's wrath is already revealed. People know it. They're not stupid. It's manifest in them. Not to them. Hallelujah. Hello? Amen. God has put in every single person on the planet that's ever breathed an intuitive knowledge that they are a sinner and that they deserve rejection instead of acceptance. You talk to people all the time. I can't approach. Job is a perfect example. We talked about Job at, on Wednesday night. He knew that he could not go to God because he was a sinner. He knew there had to be somebody who would put their hand on man and their hand on God. He says, is there not a daysman, an umpire, somebody who could put their hand on a holy God and a sinner man and come in between and stand in the gap? An intercessor. So everybody knows that in their own righteousness, they can't approach God. So what do they do? They run away from God. And what do we do? We try to convict them instead of convince them about how good the gospel is. We just pour more fire and oil on that mindset that they have that I'm not good enough for God when that's not true. Your goodness does not mean, doesn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> Thank you. And, and we try to convict them that the only way that they can obtain righteousness is by being good. No. What they have to do is, it doesn't matter how bad you are. You need to come to Christ. People say, oh, i got to get my act cleaned up before I can go to God. No, you don't. You'll never get your act cleaned up. Totally impossible. You're always going to be a dirtbag, okay? Just, that's the way it is. That on film? You got that? Dirtbag. And now, just understand this. We really are dirt bags. We're made of the dirt, right? You understand what I'm saying? But my point is, you don't try to clean your act up to go to God. Go to God, and He'll clean your act up. Don't try to get good and then go to God. It's not going to work. It can't work. You'll be frustrated. You fall under the law. Just go to God the way you are. I love that song they used to do at the Billy Graham Crusades. Just as I am. God, here I am. See what you can do with this mess. And he'll change it. He'll change it. And what we, what we do is we try to convince people that they need to change themselves or God's not going to love them. And that is so far from the truth. That's why I talk about this so much. Luke chapter 18, verses 9 to 14. And he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. You've seen those people. They just think they're righteous because they just do good things. They give a lot of money. They feed the poor. They do this. They gave millions of dollars to Irma, millions of dollars to Harvey. They're just out there. They're sending. Uh, they're just doing good because it makes them feel good on the inside. And that's okay. But that doesn't buy a brownie point with God. Bless God, it helps all those people. So, he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. And you usually figure out, the guy who can give a lot of money looks down on the guy, the guy who can give 10 million looks down on the guy that can give 50. It's the world. All right. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. Oh, boy, tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed with, thus with himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men. Extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. 
And the tax collector standing afar off would not say so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humble, humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exhausted. That's a powerful, powerful man. You know, our, let me ask you this. Are you like the Pharisee or are you like the tax collector? Because there's a lot of Christians out there that act like the Pharisee. Well, we just... I'm saved. I am good. I wear Armani shirts. God's just blessed me beyond all your wildest imaginations because I tithe. One time I saw a guy driving down a road in a Bentley and said, you know what it said in the back? I tithe. If that's not the epitome of pride, sure, that's okay. But that's where you need to be careful that you don't get hung up into that self-righteous deal. Okay? I mean, maybe he, I don't know the guy. Never met him before, but I saw that license plate and I was thinking, now what is that? What are people going to think when, first of all, half the world's going to know what that means. But those that, the, the, the guy who's been really trying to follow the Lord with all his heart sees that thinking, dude, what am I doing wrong? See, God wants to prosper you, all right? And he wants, but you need to be humble about it. When God asks you why, why you're doing so good, that gives you the opportunity yeah. to convince them Amen. instead of convicting them yes. that God is good. Amen. Hello? Amen. Some of us need to be able to explain what's going on in our lives. All right? You know, I remember years ago when we first got saved. Not when we first, we were at our, between our first and second year of Bible school. We came home and my wife decided to have a Bible study. And there were girls, uh, women that came that, most of them were saved there from the prayer meeting that we used to go to. And, and she started teaching on, I, I think it was identical, I forget what it was, but you started in Genesis. When my wife said she starts in Genesis and she gets to Revelation, it might take three or four hours, but she'll get you, to, from, she'll get you through there. But anyway, so she was doing this, <laughs> this, this teaching, and this one girl started crying. She goes, my, what's the matter? She goes, I never knew why we had to be saved. I couldn't explain why we had to be saved. And she started in the garden with the fall of man. And we might think, wow, that is so simple. We all understand it. But there are people out there that don't understand it. Point being, there was a girl that was saved and loved the Lord and didn't understand. She couldn't explain to people she just used to say, well, you just got to be saved because the Bible says so. You got to be born again. Why? The Bible said so. Jesus said it. You must be born again. That's why you need to be born again because Jesus said it. Well, what made Jesus say that? Let's go back to Genesis chapter 3. And we'll find out why Jesus said you must be born again. <coughs> you follow me? That's what we need to learn to do. And a lot of us probably understand that in our own thinking. But we don't take time to explain it to people. Why, why all this came to about, about? How good Adam had it before he sinned. But now God wants to restore all it. That's the nearly good to be true news. Amen. But, so... I'm not talking about your actions. When I looked at this parable, it's a powerful parable. And I ask, are you like the Pharisee or the publican? And I'm not talking about your actions. I'm talking about your trust. Do you trust in God? Because all of us uh, mess up. And that's why we have 1 John 1, 9. Because even forgiveness is an act of faith. When you go to God and ask Him to forgive you for messing up, 
That's an act of faith. He just don't pop up and say, okay, bud, you're forgiven. No, because the devil will come right back at you the minute you do something wrong and try to convince you God never forgave you. But he already did forgive you. He did forgive you at the cross. Well, we're just acknowledging the fact that we messed up. We're in agreement with God. All right? But do you trust in what you do for the Lord? Or do you trust in what he's done for you? Amen. Say that again. Do you trust in what you do for God? Or do you trust in what God has done for you? I rather trust in what God has done for me. No matter how much I do for God, that's all well and good. But I want how I got to trust in what God has done for me. And that's where true faith comes into to grace. When I trust in what God's done for me, what I do is immaterial. He can replace me in a heartbeat. You know, he can take me out like that. So it's not me. It's him. Hallelujah. See, if a person puts faith in their own righteous acts, uh, that that'll actually block them from the righteousness in a, re in, in a relationship with God. It'll block us from fellowship with God. If we're putting our faith in our righteousness, our righteous acts that we do, if, if that's all we think about, how good I am, how great I was to God, you're going to block the blessings in your life. Right. All right? But the person who maybe hasn't been as good kind of like messed up and they've humbled themselves and got God I'm so sorry I messed up this is the one who enters into that right standing that fellowship that relationship with God the one who's humble before God the Bible says God gives grace to the humble Amen. not the prideful person Romans chapter 9 verse 30 and 32 we're almost done what shall we say then the Gentiles who do not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. You want to underline that and circle it in your Bible. God will not be made. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they thought, did not seek it by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. There's two types of righteousness. Faith righteousness and law righteousness. <coughs> righteousness, law righteousness is righteousness based on performance. Another way to say that is self-righteousness. And self-righteousness, according to Isaiah 64, is as filthy rags. We can't be self-righteous. James chapter 2 verse 10 says that if you keep the law and yet offend one point, you are guilty of breaking the entire thing. One thing wrong and you blew it. That's the law of righteous law of righteousness. But if you put your faith in Jesus, you receive righteousness. By faith. Of faith righteousness. And guess what? You can't mess that up. Even though you did 99 out of 100 things wrong, you still can't mess it up. That's too good to be news. Too good to be true news. What a deal. There's, there's a lot of people that would never consider themselves uh, seeking after the law of righteousness, but they really are. They are. They're, and, and their only hope into entering heaven in, instead of hell is, that, is if they go to church. That's what they, If I go to church, if I be good, <clears throat> if I live up to some standard of morality, then I'm going to be okay. And that's what Jesus is talking about when he says that Paul's talking about when he says the Jews weren't seeking righteousness by faith, but they thought if they could do enough good works, 
they would earn God's blessing and the gift of heaven. And last week, I think it was last week, I don't know if it was Sunday or Monday, when we went to Revelation chapter 21, and they opened up the books. And there was the great and the small, you know, the philanthropists, all those people, and then all of the poor people. And, and God says, uh, they sit in front of God, and it says, Hi, my name's John, John John. And I gave to the Kiwanis Club. I saved the whales. I gave oh, 10 million to Harvey. Uh, I did all this good stuff. And Jesus goes, yes, you did. It's all here. He said, wait, i got to go in this other book over here. <laughs> Opens up the other book. And he goes, well, sorry, John John. Thank you for the money. But you ain't going to heaven. Because your name's not written in the Lamb's book. Of life. That's the epitome of self-righteousness. And the world is full of people like that. Great and small. What's our job? Convince them, not convict them. They're under enough conviction. That's why they're giving away so much money. Trying to get right with God. For whatever reason. And he does love them. He loves them just as much. He doesn't love me more than he loves them. But who knows, maybe over the years they were bombarded, beat up with the gospel. And I, I remember one time when we first got saved, we were nuts. Just so you know. We had a, a, a guy come to our house, him and his wife. And I still see them in my mind's eye when I sit in my rec room. I said, we beat them to a pulp with the gospel. And they never came around again. <laughs> Instead of trying to come, well, we didn't have, we didn't know enough. We didn't have enough knowledge of, of those things to like show them that this is good news. God will change your life. Oh, you got to get saved. If you don't get saved, you're going to burn in hell. And they're probably thinking we know that. Tell us something we don't know. You know, it goes on in verse 32, for they stumbled at the stumbling stone. See, it's offensive to people, particularly if they have a lot of holy actions to their names. When you tell them all their good deeds don't make them righteous before God. That really ticks them off. Then when you tell them, Sinners who only put their faith in God are more righteous than they are. That puts them over the top. That just sends them into orbit. They'll say things you mean, I'm no better than anybody who's been living in sin all their life. You're not. That's exactly what Paul said. Jesus said, well, what have I been doing all this for? Jesus said, what have I been doing all this for? Good deeds help you to a degree, okay? In your relationship with people. But they won't get you any clout with God. But your good deeds will help you with people who are not saved. Because they'll want to know why are you doing this? What's the story behind it? And then it gives you this opening to tell them how good God was for you. The Bible says we all sin and all fall short of the glory of God. All of us. not law of righteousness. It's faith righteousness. Righteousness by faith. Well, I believe in Jesus, but 
but I believe I have to live holy. Bingo. I believe once you're accepted by Jesus, you need to live holy. But living holy don't make you accepted by Jesus. You got that? Once I'm accepted, then I live holy. But I'm not going to try to live holy to get accepted by Jesus because that won't work. You know, it doesn't. It's, the holy living is something you do after you're saved. Hello? We can't pay for sin. And, and what's what it does? It really takes, in order to grasp this grace and faith message, it takes a revelation by the Holy Spirit to under, really understand it. But once you do, it'll transform the way you view God. It'll transform the way you minister to people. Okay? Uh, the way you relate to God. God is my father. Yes. Amen. I know my kids don't have much of a problem coming to their father and asking him for something. And really, they don't have much of a problem going to their mother and asking for <laughs> Because they know their mother's going to go to their father. But by the, for the most part, your kids don't. Well, I don't have a problem going to God. Why would I have a problem going to God? He's my father. Amen. He sent my older brother to die on a cross for me. Amen. He did it for me, to free me. I was held ransom. I was in the slave market of sin. And my brother became the payment for me. Why would I not go to my... That was the problem with the, the, the prodigal son. The brother couldn't understand it. How could the father be so good to this bum? Because his father loved his kids. So don't judge people out there. Don't convict people out there because here's a newsflash. God loves them as much as he loves you. I know we get mad. And I, listen, I stand, I watch some things on television. I see some actors on television. I like to throw a brick at the television set, but if they cost so much money, I would. But when I see them because they're just, you know, in, in my way of thinking, they're just, I don't know what they're thinking. But then I have to say, you know what? God died for that guy too. Or that woman too. <laughs> if I was God, only if I was God. <laughs> We'd have a pure race, then I'd be a white supremacist. That's why we're not God. Okay? God loves them. I would just make a pure race. But I'm not God. God. It's a white supremacist. Oh, God, they're listening to that. Oh, no. Is they still down there? Oh, well. Now i got to explain this. I'm not a white supremacist. I'm just saying we got to love everybody. We don't pick and choose. We might not agree with what everybody's doing out there. We might not like their actions. And I'm sure God doesn't like their actions, but God still loves them. And still offers them a way of escape. Still offers them salvation. And if they don't take salvation, God has done everything he can. So guess what? If I watch these guys on television, I, don't, I could flip the channel. And I don't have to watch them. But I do know that they need to be prayed for every day. God loves them. And that's what we're supposed to convince them that God loves them. Not convict them. So it's important that we keep our own, to keep all that stuff in check. If they upset you that much, don't watch them. You know what I mean? I, 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 don't, I don't want to mention any names, but there's a lot of them out there. You know, there's the one television show that's on during the day, and I walk into the doctor's office, 99.9% .9 out of the time it's on, and I just take a little walk. Or I take my tablet out or do something. Because I, God loves them. 
You know, he really does. They need to get a hold of it. And some of them, I think, are just doing it to get attention. Yeah. Most of them, they just dissolve it. There's no business like Joe business. You know, so that's it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. God loves him. All right? We just all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And thank God I'm a sinner that was saved by grace. I'm no longer a sinner. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. And everyone here is my brother and sister because they're in Christ. And that's what's important. No one of us are better than the other. Okay? The only thing we have to do, we have to offer is faith. It's the only thing we can offer to God is our faith and our trust. And really, we need to believe the nearly too good to be true news. That Jesus died, paid our debt, a debt we could not pay, a righteousness we could not earn, and that's called faith righteousness. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Jesus said you would know the truth, and the truth will set you free. God, why don't you come on up here? You know, I've said this a hundred times. I think it's in in uh, Philadelphia. The uh, no, no, the the post office in Philadelphia. On the top, it says, I don't know if it was the mint or the post office. It says, the truth shall set you free. I said they misquoted the Bible. It says it on there. In Greek, the truth shall set you free. But see, that's not the whole thing. It's only part of it. It says, you have to know the truth. You need to do the truth in order to be set free. Amen? You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And they have, the truth shall make you free. And they should have, you shall know the truth. Actually, they should put it in like this. Jesus said, then quotations. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. But they don't do that. You have to do it. Can you say amen? Amen. Faith, you know, faith comes, real simple, by hearing and hearing the Word of God. It's something that we do all the time. We hear the Word of God. We read the Word of God. You hear the Word of God by reading the Word of God, and letting it get into your mind, it gets into your heart, and you start to trust God. Just trust God with everything. The nearly too, too good to be true news. That's what, we, that's what we have. Let's bow our heads and pray this morning.